the Germans. Okay. Maybe the Russians. Yeah. They have an <laughs> okay, so we are on. Is it banned in China? Okay, we're 2082. That's good. Maybe. So that's the last thing. One of the two. Well, none of you should have the right place because you didn't bring your Gemaras for the last thing that we learned, which was at the seat. Oh, I just, uh, Did you? Uh, oh, uh, that's why. Right? There it is. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So I have that we are up to. Hold on. What do you have? You have cloth tests? Yes. Because that starts the new mission. Yeah, but I, we got to, we get to the new mission? No, we didn't get to the, yeah, we did get to the mission. We did get to the mission, cloth test on the other. Mary is right, okay. Remember the dog really? barking, the guy yeah. was, Right, the guy was blowing his shofar like a dog barking. Okay, it is what it is, guys. We'll start from there. We'll start from there. Okay, let's go. So, what's the mission to say? Mission on Chavta Samad Aleph. What does the mission to say? Vahayaka Asher Yarim Moshe Yado, Vigavar Yisrael, Vechule. What is this referring to? This is referring to the battle with Amalek. So remember, Bnei Yisrael left Mitzrayim, and the first nation that attacked them was Amalek. And what's the and what do we say? What happened during the battle? That when Moshe went up to the top of the uh, whatever that was there, uh, high up, he lifted up his hands. Right when they saw his hands that were up, they were victorious. And when they when his hands weren't up, they weren't victorious. Asks the Mishnah. Uh, and we'll have to talk about why this whole mission is coming in here. But as the mission of Moshe Osos Milchama Oshovros Milchama, is it the hands of Moshe that actually waged war? In other words, when Moshe's hands were up, they were victorious. When his hands weren't up, they weren't victorious. Was it his hands that were fighting the battle? Ella Lomar Lacha, but rather to teach us the following. When B'nai Yisrael would see Moshe Rabbeinu with his hands uplifted, what would happen? they would gaze upwards. And since they would gaze upwards, what's, up, what's upwards? Shamayim. They would think of a Kaddish Baruch Hu. And they would, you know, they would think of their responsibilities and they would, they would subject themselves to a Kaddish Baruch Hu's rule. Hayum is Gavrin. What would happen? They would they would be victorious. They, they they would they would start winning. The imlav, and if not, if they wouldn't do that, how you know? Them, right? They would then instead fall. So it wasn't the hands of Moshe Rabbeinu that brought about victory or defeat. It was the kavana of Bnei Yisrael that when Bnei Yisrael realized that the reason they would be victorious is because of a kaddish baruch In other words, they would look up, so to speak, and they realized they would be victorious because of kaddish baruch Then they were winning. And they would be victorious. And if, on the other hand, they thought that the reason they would be victorious was because they were better prepared, or they had a better army, or they had better, you know, generals, or whatever it was, how you know, Flim, they would fall. And under those circumstances, it would, it would, not, it would not be good. So that's what the mission, that's what the mission says. The imlab how you know, Flim. Kayotse badaver, we have a similar, there is a similar um, uh, concept. Kayotse badaver Omer, asay lecha sraf, v'sim oso al nes. Right, to make a sraf, to make a serpent, and to put it on a pole. What are we talking about here? Where is there a serpent on a pole? Where is there in the play? 
Remember, there was a plague. Kaddish Baruch Hu sent serpents to come and to kill B'nai Yisrael, right? And what happened? Moshe made this uh, serpent out of, out of copper, and he placed it on a staff. He placed the serpent on a staff, and whoever would look at the serpent would become healed. And if you didn't look up at the serpent, you would die from the snake bite. Okay? Says the Mishnah, V'haya kol hanashuch, whoever would be bitten by the snakes, by these poisonous snakes, v'ra'a oso, and would look up at this, at this brass uh, serpent that Moshe Rabbeinu put on the stick, v'chai, they would, they would live. Asks the mission of v'chi nachash memis, o nachash mechaye, right? Is it, is it the serpent, is it the snake that kills or the snake that saves? Right? Are, you, are you being killed by the snake that took a bite out of your foot? And are you being healed by this snake which is on this pole? Obviously not by either. Ella, bizman she Yisrael mistaklin kalape mala. When B'nai Yisrael would look upwards. Because that's what, the, again, this, where was the snake was on the pole. Right? The snake was on the pole. They would look upwards. Umisham dines libam la'avihem shebashamayim. And they would subjugate themselves, subjugate their parts to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, how you what would happen? HaKadosh Baruch Hu would heal them. Right? If they realize that everything comes from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, HaKadosh Baruch Hu would heal them. And if not, what would happen? They would die. Right? So B'nai Yisro, when they were bitten by the snakes, had this ability to be healed, not by just looking at this copper snake, but how? By looking at the copper snake and when looking up, at the copper snake, directing their thoughts upwards towards the Kaddish Baruch Hu and realizing that it's not a snake that kills, but it's because the Kaddish Baruch Hu allows the snake to kill. And if, if Kaddish Baruch Hu wants you to survive that poisonous bite, Kaddish Baruch Hu will enable you to survive that poisonous bite. That's, that's the idea which is, which is mentioned here. Why these things? What do we go into this whole excursion for? Because what did the last Gemara, last piece of Gemara end with? It talked about the Kavana, talked about the intention that you need to have when hearing shofar. The, the mashmiya, the one who blows the shofar, the tokeya, the one who causes the sound to be heard, and the shomeya, the one who hears the sound, both of them have to have the proper intention, okay? And we learned that if the guy is hired, this is what his job is, so then you know that, they, that he has intention to, you know, to have to include everyone in his, you know, in his kavana. Okay, good. Now the now the mission is going to get back to some uh, halachic stuff. Okay, that was a nice little excursion. Now we're getting back to some halachic stuff. Okay. Cheresh shota v'kata. What are these things? Who are these people? It's like a famous trio. Cheresh shota v'kata. Cheresh is a deaf mute. A person who is a deaf mute. A shota is a person who is mentally incompetent. And a katan is someone who is under the age of majority, meaning under 13 for a boy, under 12 for a girl. Okay? Says the Mishnah, Cheresh shota the katan, ein motzien es harabim What do we say about them? They can't blow shofar to fulfill the obligation of the rabbin. Let's say I have a kid, like an eight-year-old kid, who has been practicing blowing shofar a whole year, and he's perfect, flawless. This kid gets up and blows shofar, I'm not Yotze. Right? I'm not Yotze. If I have somebody who's mentally incompetent who gets up to blow shofar, I'm not Yotze. And if I have somebody who's deaf, or a deaf mute, I'm also not Yotze. So why am I not Yotze in all of these cases? Two of them, because they don't have the, they can't have the intent. <laughs> Under 13, you can't intend to be Yotze for everybody, and if you're mentally deficient, then you don't have it. But if okay. you're deaf, you could have the intent. <laughs> <laughs> just so clear what you're doing. It's a halakhic status. Right? If you're these, or if you're these are halachic. These are halachic statuses. Right, right. But if you don't, if you have these statuses, you can't uh, 
he motes the other yeah, people. But, so I'm asking the question, why? So are you saying it's just a decree and that's it? It well, seems a lot. If, if a, deaf, a deaf person can be included for a million, if they're over 13. Right? Correct. So that's then correct. obviously, uh, so it makes sense that because they can't hear the chauffeur, if you can be counted for a million, you're deaf and mute. But you just, in this case, it's the chauffeur because you can't hear what's going on, then it must have something to do with hearing and making the sound. That's what well, if you're mentally lacking, can you be counted for a million? If you are mentally lacking, you cannot be counted for a million. To a certain degree, like you could answer. If you're a shota, <laughs> right, you can't be counted for a million. What's a shota, by the way? I mean, it says an imbecile. We could have we could have a broad definition here, right? Any 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 one of us any one of us knows people who uh, you know who uh, what what is a shota? Well, they have to have the intent can I be, to represent them. Can, can I be represented by, by Harvey Weinstein? No, you're not. Right? If Harvey Weinstein it's blew good. the show, not a show. Right? If Harvey Weinstein blew the show, he doesn't hear the word no. I don't know. If Harvey Weinstein, I mean, you know, rough months, we should never. Uh, we should make fun of the poor victim. Hey, we should have correct. Have I mean, if Harvey Weinstein, he's a, he's a, a low life, a no good guy. If he would blow the chauffeur, would we be Yotze? Okay, if he would blow the chauffeur properly, we'd be Yotze, right? In other words, it's not a moral thing, it's a halachic thing. And why? So now the principle, the mission is going to tell us, this is the principle, someone who is not obligated in a matter, okay. He cannot fulfill this responsibility for other people, right? So that's, that's right. Yeah. right. So that's why the, that's right. you were right. right. So Michael was absolutely right. The deaf person can't hear. And since the deaf person can't hear, he, he's exempt from this mitzvah of tekiya shofar. Right. right. In other words, the mitzvah of shofar is hearing the shofar. He can't hear the chauffeur, so he's exempt from the mitzvah. If he's exempt from the mitzvah, he can't fulfill the obligation for somebody else. Okay, what's a shota? That's but who, a. But who makes the determination of who's a shota? Yeah, how do you? Is it like you go to a basin? <laughs> so the Gemara, the Gemara in Maseches Chadiga talks about what are the criteria for someone to be declared a shota, right? So the Gemara says. If a person does either one opinion says all three of these things or one of these three things, he is a shota. Okay, what is it? So number one is a person who goes out alone at night to an uninhabited area. And goes walking in the middle of nowhere. Okay, that's alone. that's a lot. That's one thing. A second thing. What's the second thing? A person who sleeps in a cemetery, right? Person sleeps in a cemetery, he's a shofar. What's the third thing? Person who tears his clothing for no apparent reason. Right? Tears his clothing for no apparent reason. Now, any one of these things could have a logical explanation to it or at least an explanation to it so for instance why is the guy why is the guy going for a walk at night alone where there's nobody around right he the, the gemara Chagiga says he's depressed and he needs to clear his head or he's you know uh, he's he's melan, mel, melancholic mm -hmm. and he needs uh, he needs a different perspective or he needs some fresh air or he's got a He's got a fever and he needs, you know, he's whatever, you know, there, you could explain a reason why somebody would go on a, on a walk at night by themselves in an uninhabited place. Okay, what about tearing one's clothes? So you could find a reason to explain why an individual is tearing his clothes. Right? You know, it might be, a, you know, it might be a yeah, logical so tearing for no reason. reason. Right? No, but I'm saying, in other words, if it could be very, very right. distraught. To pay it could be distraught, and he's tearing his clothes, or, or it could be that he's he doesn't even realize he's tearing his clothes. You know, he's 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 upset about something. He doesn't realize he's tearing his clothes. 
Yeah, sleeping in the winter is a little bit more challenging to find a to find a logical explanation for. So the Gemara Masefes Kagigas says a person would sleep in the cemetery if he wants a ruach to uh, you know he wants to he wants to uh, to conjure up uh, you know these uh, evil spirits that can help him do uh, acts of sorcery, kishu. Right? That where 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 are all these spirits hanging out? They're hanging out in the cemetery. Right? They're hanging out in the cemetery. So at least that's what they say. So those are the only three criteria. Oh, so okay. So wait a second. So we don't do those. In other shows, well, no matter right. what else you do. No, no, no. So that's 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 precisely what Terry's asking. So first of all, the Gemara says if you do any one of those three, we don't classify you as a shelter because we there could be a logical reason for it. If you do all three, we consider you a shelter. If you do all three, we consider you a shelter. Now. Then the Gemara goes over the discussion. What about if you do something that's clearly, yeah, clearly defies any kind of logical explanation, but it's not one of these three. So the Gemara says, you're a shelter. In other words, the, the Gemara gives these examples because we can learn from these examples, meaning, we learn from this that if an individual does one of these three things, there could be a logical explanation for it. If he does all three, it's very unlikely. Learn from that, that if a person does something which is meshuga, and there's no logical explanation for it, he's a shota. Everybody would say he's a shota. Maybe you're right. So, so the question is, let's say that you have a guy who's borderline. You know, you got a guy, you know, sometimes there's a guy, you know, shuls have guys who uh, mumble to themselves. They, uh, you know, they come show up at weird hours of the morning and the evening, you know, whatever it is, right? They, you know, they come in, you know, they come in torn clothing, you know, whatever it is. You know, there's always, right, there's always, uh, you know, there's always that kind of, you know, that kind of person, right? You're not sure if he's a shelter or not, right? So, but don't let him blow the shelter. Yeah. Yeah. So you wouldn't let him blow the shelter. But, but there might be, but there might be other ramifications also. So I guess ultimately a bezdin would have to make bezdin yeah. would have to be possible. Like stopping, I mean. It's not like a firm what you didn't you want. Start, you start acting normally. You, uh, you know, shelter's not a permanent staff. Yeah, permanent. Okay. Um, so in all of these cases, a cheresh, a deaf mute, or some say just deaf, not even a deaf mute, but just deaf. Cheresh, shelter, the katan. In all of these cases, since they are not obligated in the mitzvah, they cannot be motzi other people in the mitzvah. So even the even if he blows the shofar perfectly, every note precise, crisp, clear can't be motzi other people. Can you can you think of some other examples where this might apply? For a woman, can a woman do a bris nila? Can a woman be the mohel? Do you have any instances in Chumash that you remember of a woman being a Moha? That must be obvious. Sipora and Moshe Rabbeinu, does this ring any bells? They were on their way to Mitzrayim, right? They were on their way to Mitzrayim, right? And uh, they had, this was their second son, Eliezer. And Eliezer had been born, but Moshe hadn't circumcised him yet. And they come and they, they come to this place to, to sleep overnight. And this angel appears as a snake to starts to swallow Moshe, right? Starts to attack Moshe, swallow Moshe. Sipora goes and takes a stone, very sharp stone, I guess, and circumcises Eliezer and uh, saves Moshe Rabbeinu's life. Wait a second, Eliezer. Eliezer was older. No, Gershom. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm thinking of Aaron. Aaron was older. Right, Gershom was the firstborn. Eliezer was the secondborn. So she circumcises. She circumcises Eliezer, and and Moshe is spared. So maybe a woman could be a Mohel. The answer is no. A woman cannot be a Mohel. Why there was she able to do what she did? Pikuach nefesh. All right. In other words, she needed to save. She needed to save uh, her husband. This, she had to do what she had to do. Yeah, well, yeah, so, right? to oh, so Eliezer probably would be like the toughest guy right. under those circumstances. You know, it's not bad, right? <clears throat> but, 
but generally a woman can't be a mocha. Can a woman write filler? Can a woman write filler? Let's say she's very artistic, very, you know, beautiful handwriting. She's very precise. You know, can she? Why not? Have to be, it's because she's not out. Well, they have to be pure. They have to be, they have to be, they have to be clean, ritually clean. Okay, she well, goes, she goes to the mikvah. She, the the she, she works writes. two weeks out of the mikvah. Right. And she goes to the mikvah and then she writes. The answer is no. A woman can't be a sofa. Why not? Because she can't, because she, she can't do something that she's not obligated in mm -hmm. that other people are going to use to fulfill their obligation. So she can't write fill in that will be legally. But these mm -hmm. people are not, they're not not obligated in chauffeur. They're just not able to fulfill that. Mm. A, show, a, a deaf person can't hear chauffeur. Right. So you're, you're absolutely right for the case of the deaf person. Deaf person cannot hear a chauffeur. He is physically unable. Right. To fulfill the mitzvah. What about a shoka? Okay, they can hear it, but whether they understand what they're hearing and recognize. I mean, listen. There are crazy people. Right? There, there are certifiably crazy people yeah. who have moments of clarity, right? All the time we see, you know, moments of clarity. So who's to say that that this shota doesn't understand what he's doing at that precise moment? But it doesn't matter. No, 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 In other words, yeah. the Torah says if you're a shota, you're not obligated. In, in other words, it's not, it's not, he can hear, oh, no, right? The Shota can hear and the Shota can even understand what it is. He can even have the Kavana for what it is, but because he's a Shota, he is halachically exempt from the mitzvah. Well, it's, a status. it's a status, right? That's what I think you were saying before. It's halachically, it's a status. A kata, right? A, a, let's say a kata whose bar mitzvah is in 20 minutes. Oh, right. So in other words, in twenty minutes. minutes. Right. In other words, he's 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 not going to be physically any different in twenty minutes than he is right now. But he's he has the status of being up, and he can't fulfill the can't fulfill the minutes. A woman could be a chazan for other women, but not for you. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that means. It's over here every year. I don't, I don't know what that's about. Yeah, let's make, uh, yeah, make like, uh, like the Yom Kippur when, when the chazan gets up and makes the. Uh, You're saying that a woman could be a shliach tzibur? Yeah, just for other women. For other women. For no, no, there's no concept of a shliach tzibur. There's no concept of a tzibur for women. Uh, uh, I mean, you could have a hundred women in a room. It's not a minion. It's not a tzibur. No, it's not a minion. It wouldn't be considered a tzibur. It's not a tzibur. It's a group of women. You can say that really, man. No, but I mean, it's no. not, a, it's, again, it's a status, right? It's, it's not a moral judgment, it's a status. In other words, a tzibur is, a tzibur for davening is 10 males who are above the age of 13. And are in shota. And are in shota, right. And maybe some other. Right. I mean, a cherish is obligated, right. but, right? But uh, it's there not may a be other status. Right, not a cut. Yeah. Right, so... A woman who, like, let's say, uh, you know, women's, we have women's tefillah, right? So, right? so they dab in Shabbos Mincha. What does it mean they dab in Shabbos Mincha? Right? They say the Shemona Esrei, and one woman doesn't say the Shemona Esrei, and she then says the Shemona, her Shemona Esrei out loud. It, it mimics a Shaliyah Tzibor, but it's not, it's not Chazar Sashat's. It's not, it's not tefillah b'tzibor. It's not, you know, that, that doesn't exist. They don't say Kaddish. They don't say Kedusha. They don't say Baruch Hu. You know. And even Kriya Satora is not being motzi the obligation. Because it is an obligation. So I'm not sure. You know, I'm yeah, not that, sure. That was sort of right, the, question, yeah. and the question doesn't matter. Yeah. The question doesn't matter. I mean, you're obviously looking for something that a woman... Right, know, like where, right. If it was like a split status. Like a, under one circumstance, it's... Workable and other services. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not the case. Maybe we can come up with the case. Though. Okay. So let's go right through the Gemara. Um, so the Gemara says, Tanu Rabbanan, we're on um, 29.82. Tanu Rabbanan, the rabbis learned, Akol Chayavin Shofra. Everybody is obligated in Kiyah Shofra. Who is everybody? Kohanim, Mudim, Yisraelim. 
duh. Yeah, like, right. right? Like, yeah, come on, right? Like, oh, right? Who else is there? Right. right? Of course, Kohanim would be immediate. So, I mean, who, you know, obviously, we're going to find out there's a reason why you might have thought sure. that Kohanim are not obligated. There's a reason you might have thought that would be might not be obligated. But so the, the Gemara is telling us everybody's obligated Kohanim Ravim and Israeli, Gerim, what's a Ger? Convert. Va'avadim Mishuch Rarim. Okay, freed slaves. Now, what kind of slaves are we talking about here? We're not talking about Ebed Ivri. We're not talking about a Jewish slave because a Jewish slave retains his obligation whether he's a slave or not a slave. Because a Jewish, you got to give a Jewish slave off to go to Shul. It doesn't matter. But here we're talking about an Ebed Kenani. What's the status of an Evid Kanan? What's the status of an Evid Kanan? A non Jew who becomes your Evid. You purchase him. He becomes part of your household and he's out there like you. Not 100%. Okay. An Evid Kanani gets a Brisnila, first of all. Gets a Brisnila. Secondly, he has an obligation in certain mitzvos, and he's exempt from certain mitzvos. Right? Now, why? Why? Like, why not just let him be the this Evid Kanani? I was talking to somebody. They have a housekeeper who is from I don't know, I'm not sure where she's from. She has a little statue in her yeah. room, and you know, yeah. know does incense and yeah. all of those. Like, older, like, yeah, like right, like why yeah. don't we? Why don't we just say, okay, you know, you, you, know, thing, right? you do your thing. I'm doing my thing, you do your thing. No, the Evid, right? The Evid Kanani, we, in other words, if he's going to be part of our house, we are going to require certain things. He doesn't have a choice, right? He's our Evid Kanani. He is an indentured servant, right? You can call him a slave if you want. He's an indentured servant, meaning that he, you pay money, you acquire rights to use him as a servant. You're not allowed to abuse him, but you certainly are allowed to use him as a servant. And since he's going to be a servant in your house, he has to act in a particular way, right? I mean, well, you know, what's it, what would it be like to have a, you know, a, a, a guy who's, who's Ovid of Odazara, you know, in your house? It wouldn't work. It's only the person who's living there. Boy, only can put to slave. Even not code? All right, he has to, right. He has to observe certain mitzvahs. Okay, so when he's your slave, he has a bris milah. He's obligated in all mitzvahs that are not mitzvahs tzadzman grama, meaning he is obligated on the, the same way in which a woman is obligated. They are both exempt from positive time-related commandments. Again, theoretically, because for neither one is their time their own. The woman, her time belongs to her family. The Evid Kanani, his time belongs to his owner, right? His master, his owner, whatever. So both of them, they don't have exclusive control over their time, and therefore they are exempt from mitzvos ase shazman grama. What happens if you free your Evid Kanani? He now becomes a full-fledged Jew. Mm -hmm. If I free my Evid Kanani, yeah, he becomes a full-fledged a full-fledged Jew. So the question is, it's interesting. Why doesn't the Gemara include him under Geirim? Mm -hmm. Right, because in effect, he's a Geir. Right, in effect, this right, this Evid who is Meshuchra, this freed servant, is like a Geir. So there's a reason why he's not included under Geir, and we have to. We're gonna. He's not, automatically a Jew, or he has to, he's allowed to become a Jew. He simply becomes a Jew, no other, no further process. He doesn't have a choice. Well, it says it's the same type of conversion. It's a brisk mila and then mikra. Well, no, does he have a choice? Right. Does he have a choice? He have a choice. Right. He have a choice. He have a choice. And when he leaves your house, if he goes back to, to Mahalo Shabbos, is he subject to whatever, Lisa and all those kinds of things? I think the idea is yeah. that he, this is something that he wants to do. In other words, if a person doesn't want, to, we don't make a person Jewish against his wishes. Well, when we buy him, we give him a bris and we obligate him against we his give wishes. Him, well, that's because we're well enough. I, I, I can say no, but once we awesome. free him, once we free him, we can't, I don't think it's feasible. Because once we free him, he has to, the, the idea that we're talking about this Evan Meshuchah 
is an Ebed who has come into the family, he's had a bris meal, he's actually gone to Mikra, and he's observing mitzvahs, and he wants to be Jewish. And now you free him, poof, he's Jewish. So, so it's a, well, it, it, is, it is like a kid. Well, I know, but he's not a kid. He's a Jew if he wants to be. Right. It's a Jew if he wants to be. Which footnote are you looking at? Is it that I show you some of day, or is it a long time now? Is not obligated. Where do you see that? Where do you see that? He says the bride selects the free slave separately only for the purpose of implying that he is not obligated in mitzvah. So before, before he's free. He's free right? Yeah, that's nothing to do with, uh, nothing to do with. Uh, assuming, I, I, it's just, it's not logical to assume. And if he doesn't want to be a Jew, we force him to make him a Jew. Because then he'd be subject to uh, all the economy. Correct. Right. Yes. No, it's his indentured service. He's holding that over there. He doesn't have to stay. If he chooses to stay, then he's still part of the household. <laughs> then he's taking on all the obligations. <laughs> oh, because he, he could walk away at that point. It's he logical. Could. It's logical, but I'm not. In other words, when you free your Evid, right, you free your Evid Kanani, does he have to say, okay, I want to be Jewish? What if he wants to be Jewish and move to Lakewood? Like, is that fine? Can he do that? Is, it, is he, you know, is he considered, right. Right, is he considered a Jew like everybody else? Like children, you know, like, right. So we'll do some, we'll do some more work. Right. Yer Tashem, we'll do some more work on that for next week. That's a good question. You always a good question. So now Evid I'm going to get your attention. Cannot be your Shabbos guy. And Evid can yeah. Okay. So let's go. Um, now let's get, we're going to get a little bit more interesting now. The tumtum. What is a tumtum? Right? A tumtum is a person who we can't tell the sex of this person. Right? Why can we not tell the sex of this person? Because the genital area is covered with some kind of skin covering. And we don't know what's underneath the skin. In other words, does the person have the genitalia of a man or does the person have the genitalia of a woman? We don't know. We don't know. And since we don't know, we don't, like, what is this? Is this, is, is this person a he or is this person a she? Okay, we don't know, right? Well, it's either a he or a she. Okay. Right? Well, what I'm saying the tum tum is either, is halachically either a he or a she. Or maybe we don't know. In other words, maybe that's what you mean by neither, meaning we can't conclude one way or the other. Let's see. That's a tumtum. The androgynos. What's an androgynos? Androgynous. Androgynous. What's androgynous? I thought that's the same as a tumtum. You can't tell what No, androgynous, both. you can tell. An androgynous has both, has genitalia of a man and a woman. That's, it's like a hermaphrodite. That's, yeah. right? Okay. that's, Right, that's 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 an androgonus. So what question? So question oh. is the same. Okay, so so you, you ask an interesting point, right? Or is this like I don't want to say two peas in a pod, but is this right? No, is this like? Aren't they like, the, same they, aren't they the same idea? Right? Aren't, they the, right? aren't they the same idea? So the answer is yes and no. <laughs> of course, right? they are they are the <laughs> same. Right, they are the same idea from the perspective of. I can't tell what they are. What they are. What their gender. But they're not the same idea for the fo- from the following perspective. In other words, a tumtum is either a male or a female. Okay, it's one or the other. The tum- we, we can't tell because it's not apparent. It's not visible. But a tumtum is either a male or a female. And androgonis or an, an, a hermaphrodite, right? And, and both, right? We don't know. In other words, right, he has it both. both. It, it has both male and female simani. So, 
right? Is it a male or is it a female? So it, it could be male, it could be female. So what would be the difference? The difference would be like this. If I have a tum tum, just to, right, I have it could resolve tum, tum tum A right. and tum tum B, okay? If I have tum tum A and tum tum B, can one tum tum fulfill the obligation for another tum tum? Okay. What are they? Well, they couldn't. They couldn't take on the obligation to begin with. We're talking about shofar. Yeah. Right. We're talking about shofar. So, can one tumtum fill the obligation for another tumtum? No. Why? Because that the tum the, the one supposedly fulfilling the obligation isn't itself obligated. We don't know that. Well, we don't know if it's obligated or not. So either they're both they're they're obligated or they're not. Uh, okay. One or the other. Okay. If the answer is they're obligated, then they can fulfill and they can fulfill it for all. Okay, so this, in other words, this is where we're going to, if I have two tum tums, right? Or if I have, <laughs> or if I have two um, uh, androgynous individuals, can they fulfill the, clearly, well, we have, we have to, we're about, can they fulfill the obligation for us? Well, if they're obligated, right? they should be able to. Right, so that's, right. but we don't, right, this is the whole thing. We don't know enough to make a determination. We'll have to see. That's well, that's, why the, that's why the that's why the Gemara is raising it. So let's see. Let's say what does the Gemara say? So the Gemara says the tum tum, the androginos. When it comes to these two unique individuals, or mishechetzio eved bechetzio ben cholin, a person who's half freed slave and half still slave. How can that be? How can you have a slave who's half slave and half free? Let's say the slave was owned by two people and one owner freed him and one owner still owns him. So he has the status of half free person and half slave. The, the part of him that belonged to the... Part of that? What do you get like, I got the left half? No, you don't, have, no, no, no. Say, you don't have to define a half. In other words, 50% of this Eved belonged to Mr. Jones. And 50% of this Evid belonged to Mr. Smith. Right? I don't, I, I, I don't have to. Right? Evid, I, I, no, so that's the whole point. In other words, well, right? When, if, Mr., if Mr. Jones freed the Evid, he only freed 50% of that Evid. Which 50%? It's irrelevant. Right? It, you know, it's not like half, I free the left half or the right half. No, he freed 50% of that Evid, which maybe in every cell. 50% of that cell is a free Evid cell, and the other half is an Evid cell, right? In other words, you have, you have an Evid with two masters, one freed him and one didn't free him. So that's the case of a, of a Mishet, Chetzio Evid, Chetzio Ben Chori. So in all of these, so let's look at all of these cases. So the mission is going to say, Tum Tum, the Gemara, I'm sorry, Tum Tum, Enu Motzi, Lo Es Mino, Velo Es She'eno Mino. When it comes to a tum tum, tum tum's gonna blow shofar, okay? So I have two possibilities. Either this, guy, this tum tum is a guy, right? Or it's a woman. Or, or it's a woman. But I have no way of knowing. I have no way of knowing. And since I have no way of knowing, he can't blow shofar for me. Why? Because I can only be yotze with someone who himself has a chiv. This so person may not. this person might not have a chiv, okay. right? So therefore he can't be motzi me, right. right? With my obligation. Can he be motzi another tum tum? No, because maybe the other tum tum, let's say the guy who, the tum tum who's blowing the shofar, may, may right? Maybe he's really a woman. Oh, right. and, no and the tum tum who's listening, maybe he's really a man. So we don't allow a tum tum to blow shofar for a non tum tum or, or a tum tum. Okay? He's, he's not motse lo es mino, meaning he can't be motse another tum tum, the lo es sheino mino, and he can't be motse a person who's clearly a man. I can't be motzi either of those for those reasons. 
The mission then goes on and says, Andri, um, androginos, when it comes to an androginos, what's the halacha? Motsi es nino, he can be motsi another androginos, velo es she'eno mino, but he can't be motsi a, a, a regular person. Let's think about that. What does that mean? Right? Miss, right, uh, 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 I don't even know what to say. <laughs> a, a is an androgynous. What does that mean? He has simanim, both of a male and a female. We don't know whether he's halakhically classified as a male or halakhically classified as a female. But he is definitely classified as either a male or a female. B, who's an, also an androgynous, is in the same boat, meaning he's definitely a male or a female. Right. Whatever one androgynos is, that's, that's the same halakhic status for every other androgynos, yeah, like except, except we don't know what it is. But the, it's the same halakhic status for every one of them. So androgynos A is blowing shofar. Androgynos B listen. is listening. Good. If androgynos A is a male, and he, therefore now he's Chayev. Right. And, and if androgynous A is a male, then by definition, androgynous B is a male. And therefore, he's fulfilled, A has fulfilled the obligation for B. And if he's a woman, then he wasn't. If he's a woman, then they're both women, and there's nothing to talk about. Right? In other words, if he's a woman, they're both women, there's nothing to talk about. So that's when it comes to an androgynous. But that's all, he can be Motse Mino. He can be Motse A. I don't know if fellow is the correct word. He can be mozi a fellow, a similar androgynous. Or he can be mozi another androgynous. But he can't be mozi she'eno. Meaning he can't blow shofar for us. I'm making the assumption here that none of us at the table are androgynous. Right? He can't blow shofar for us. So why can't he blow shofar for us? Because be maybe he's a she. Right? Maybe he's a she. Was, was, it, was the population... A large enough percentage for the mother to devote so much time to this? So this is amazing, isn't it? Yeah. It's really amazing. What's more it's, it's, I mean, well, it, it, but right it, it is, but I mean, could anybody, I, I did, I, you know, I did a little bit of research on the internet. I didn't Today's come across world, any I mean. world, any, any cases today of a person who's born with genitalia of both a male and a female. So that I think is more common than the other one. That's more common than 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 somebody who you don't know what they have. And it's um, and it's um, right. I mean, that's all. I mean, I mean, I don't think it's very common, but I think it does occur. I would imagine with the tum tum, they could they would probably do surgery. They could figure out figure out. out. Well, well, Next right. 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 No, no, no. The Gemara time, they had no way of knowing. Right. At the Gemara time, they had no way of knowing. But again, you know, this obviously there were people because we find references to Tum Tum and Androginos in lots of different halachas. So obviously, there were individuals who were Tum Tum and Androginos in the community. I mean, it seems but crazy. There's a lot of communities, right? In the Jewish community. What but I mean, like all the, you know, all the communities of the community. a lot of Correct. It just seems like it's an issue that the rabbis. Had <laughs> it was an issue the rabbis had to deal with, right? This was, you know, I, I don't know. Is it is it that at one time it was more prevalent naturally than it is today? Is yeah. such a thing possible? I don't know. You know, the doctors are not here tonight to uh, you know, to weigh in. Night, they're not here tonight to weigh in, but uh, but that's I, it's a good question. I don't know the answer to that question, but yeah, nevertheless, the Gemara, right, the Gemara does. I've seen, I've seen six times. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't. He doesn't go higher than <laughs> Jeff doesn't go, go lower than the, than the neck, and Mitchell doesn't go higher than the knee. And we have no way here. Right? No way. No. Okay. So, just an interesting case that there that these are the there are such cases that are discussed in the Gemara and codified in the Halacha of Tum Tum and Androginos. Okay. So the, let's go right to in the Gemara. So the Gemara is now the Gemara is going to go back to the beginning of the statement. The beginning of the statement. Which said, Hakol Chayabim B'tkiya Shofar Kohanim Levim B'Yisrael. Hakol Chayabim B'tkiya Shofar Kohanim Levim B'Yisrael. Pshita. You know how you translate that? Duh. Duh. Like, of course, like, it's obvious, right? 
Ihani lo mechayve, man mechayve. Right? If we don't, if we if we don't say the Kohanim Levim and Yisraelim are obligated, so who's <laughs> obligated? <laughs> who's, left? <laughs> Who, who's left? Right? You know, is there somebody other than a Kohen a Levi or Yisrael? I don't Gare. think so. Right? I don't know, but Gary or Yisrael, right? Or Yisrael, right? So the Gemara comes along, and the Gemara says, "Okay, Kohanim it's the that the Brisa had to, or the Mishnah here had to come and tell us Kohanim were obligated." Why? I might have thought that Kohanim were not obligated. Why would I have thought that? Says the Gemara, Salka Daita Chamina, I might have thought, Hoil Uksiv, since it is written regarding the mitzvah of Shofar, Yom Teruah Yielachem, there should be a day of Trua for you. So what might I have thought? I might have thought that Kohanim are exempt from this. Why are Kohanim exempt? Man, so the only people who should be obligated in this are man de lese ella betekia de chad yoma. The only people who should be obligated are people for whom there's no obligation to blow a shofar every day. It, the only people who should be obligated when it says yom teruah yelachem is for the people for whom there is an obligation on one yom, or one, right at one, one day, I mean two days, but one time. And that would exclude Kohanim. Why? Because, says the Mishnah, Vahani Kohanim, Hoil Vi'isnuhu Bisikios, the Chol Hashana. Kohanim are obligated in blowing shofar all year long. What does that mean, Kohanim are obligated in blowing shofar all year long? Because the Pasuk says, what are you supposed to do? What did the Kohanim do? Right? There's a lot of Kohanim. Right? So when the Karban was brought, not every Kohen was involved in shechting the Karban or skinning it or collecting the blood. Some of the other Kohanim who were around, what did they do? They blew the, not sure, well, they blew the, the trumpets. Right, they blew the trumpets. So these, for, for Kohanim, there's no such thing as Yom Teruah. Because for them, every workday is a Teruah. And right? every workday is a Yom Teruah. So when the Torah obligates Yom Teruah, maybe we would think it only applies to somebody who has a Yom. Only applies to somebody who has a one-time obligation of Teruah. Somebody who's doing Teruah all the time, every time he works. So maybe it doesn't apply to that person. So, Ama lo. So, what do I have to say? I come along and say, ah, "There's a reason why there is a reason why the why the Gemara tells me Kohanim, because I might have thought they would be exempt." What about Levim? Um, all right. So, let before we get to that. So, Uskatim bechatzotros al olo sechem. So, Ama lo. I might have said lo lechayiv. Don't make them chayiv. Come Ashmolan. Along comes the Mishnah to tell me that they are chayiv. Says the Gemara. Me dummy. Why do you compare these two cases? Right? Me dummy is one, doesn't mean oh, who's the dummy. It means, <laughs> right, me, right, from Dim Yon, right? Who says they're similar? Right? Me dummy. Hasam chatzotros, ha ha shofar. Right? Here there's an obligation of sounding a shofar. There, when they bring the karbonos, what are they doing? They're blowing chatzotros. Chatzotros are trumpets. They're clearly trumpets. Shofar is a shofar, is a ram's horn. Not the same thing. Ella itzrich. So the Gemara says, you're right. That's a good point. So I'm going to give you, so there's another reason why you might have excluded Kohanim. Salka daita chamina. I might have thought, ho'il usnan, since we learn, shave hayovel l'rosh Hashanah l'skiya v'lebrachos. We learn in a Mishnah that when it comes, where do we, where do we learn out the obligation to blow shofar? Um, or, or let's, let, let's put it this way. The, the Mishnah says that the shofar blast at the end of Yom Kippur is the same as the shofar blast on Rosh Hashanah. Now, we don't do it that way. Right? When we sound shofar at the end of Yom Kippur, it's simply a zecher. It's a reminder of the fact that they used to blow shofar at the end of Yom Kippur on the Yovel Yom. But when they actually observed the Yovo year and they blew shofar at the, at the end of Yom Kippur on the Yovo year, it was the same way they blew shofar 
on Rosh Hashanah. So there's a connection between Yovel and Rosh Hashanah. And therefore, I might have thought the following. I might have thought, Man di Isei b'mitzvahs ha-Yovel, Isei b'mitzvahs de Rosh Hashanah, that a person who is, a person who's bound by Yovel is also bound by Rosh Hashanah. And the converse is true, meaning a person who is not bound by Yovel is not bound to hear Shofar on Rosh Hashanah. What's the story with Kohanim? Are they bound by Yovel or not bound by Yovel? But what happens on Yovel? What happens? What are we going to talk about on Yovel? What happens? The 50th year. What? All the land reverts. All the land reverts back to its original owners. All the land reverts back to its original owners. They don't own Kohanim didn't have land. Right? Kohanim didn't have land. So Kohanim, are, it's not Shayef, right? Yovel is not Shayef by Kohanim. So therefore, I might have thought, since Yovel is not Shayef by Kohanim, and since Yovel and Rosh Hashanah are connected, Kohanim are not obligated in Rosh Hashanah show. Along comes the, the Gemara to tell me, or along comes the mission to tell me that they are obligated, right? The least in the mitzvah, the Yovel, right? So I'm going to learn precisely how Kohanim are not. Can we stay for two more minutes just to get to the two dots? Okay, right? So, so the Kohanim are not in the midst of Yovel. This is not because we learned the following. Kohanim and Levim. Kohanim and Levim. Mochrin la'olam. They can sell property. La'olam. Forever. Right? Doesn't go back at Yovel. And they can redeem property forever. For it's generally people don't have a... If you sell a house in a walled city, you have a year to redeem it. Right? If you don't redeem it within that year, you lose it forever. Including Yovel. Including Yovel. Yovel doesn't right? Including Yovel. Yovel. But Kohanim doesn't apply to. Kohanim, if they sell their house, they can always redeem it. Right? So they're, right? they're not in the right? They're not in the category. Right? They're not in the category of Yovel. Since they're not in the category of Yovel, so then they are, uh, I might have thought that they're, um, <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, so aim of the mitzvah the Rosh Hashanah lo lachayvo. Maybe they're not obligated in the show for a Rosh Hashanah. Kamash Milan, they are obligated. We'll stop here. Thank you. Okay, let's see. Do we have anybody? Nope, just me. Okay, how many down?